Let's stand together. It's time to worship the Lord. He's worthy of our praise. So let's join our hearts together and sing to Him today. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the King of kings. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. and saints cry out we join them as we sing glory to God glory to God glory to God forever yes Lord glory to God glory to God glory to God forever
Sometimes we as people of God forget we can run to the rock who is higher than we are. So maybe in that situation that you're in right now, maybe instead of calling your friends, maybe you need to call on the Lord. Maybe you need to run to his arms today. Maybe instead of running to the doctor, maybe you need to run to the king of kings who is the great physician. Maybe instead of running to the lawyer, you need to run to the one who is your advocate before the father today. Church that said, 
Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. What if instead of turning to the solutions of man, we turn to the king today? So, Lord, we run to your arms right now. We lift our hands and we surrender to you because we can't do anything about the situation anymore, Father. It's gone too far. We've exhausted all of our resources. So, Lord, like the lady with the issue of blood, we have no choice but to touch the hem of your garment today and to trust in your faithfulness and your goodness to us today. Lord, we bless you today because you are faithful. You are true. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus.
praise today for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
service to the Lord this morning. Such a simple song. Such a simple song. But he's so holy. He's so worthy of our praises. Just because he's holy. steps in because he cleansed my lips right before my eyes and then from the sound of the praises of the heavenly host the pillars shook the pillars shook from the magnitude of the praise the praise rising before the father the praise rising before the almighty God the one who is holy and we sing that now to him lift your voice and sing It's called 
trusted in the trial and the change, this one thing remains. Higher than the mountains, and it's higher than the mountains that I've faced. Do you believe that, church? And it's stronger than the power of the grave. And it's constant in the trial and the change. This one thing remains. This one thing remains. Your love never fails. Your love. Singing your love, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. Oh, oh, oh. 
circumstances in the darkest of the night you can experience that love today matter of fact if you need to why don't you just why don't you just lift up a hand and just whisper Lord I need your love and I'm thankful for it still getting it choir. Somebody's still getting it church. So Lord, we just bask in your love right now. We thank you for it. You've been so good to us, Jesus. We love you. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. All that is within me. Bless his holy name. Love him, church. Yeah. He is so good. Yeah. Hallelujah. You can be seated today. Good morning, Regency Church. Betsy and I are so sorry that we're not able to be with you in worship today. This week, we've been in Belgium, where I've been speaking at the Western Europe Conference for the Church of God. Since we were this close, we also decided that we would take a couple of extra days. So today we are in Dublin spending some time with daughter Kelly. We're hoping to be able to join you by live stream, but that's going to depend on what the internet connection is like. Either way, I want you to know that you are in our thoughts and our prayers. We're believing God for great things for your life today. We're expecting miracles. We are in an autumn harvest season of miracles, and I'm believing that today God is going to show up big in your life. Since I'm not able to be there in my absence, I want to bring to you my good friend Rick Fowler once again to speak for me. He was there a couple of months ago and preached in my absence as well. You received him so graciously and God showed up so wonderfully out of his ministry. I thought it would be a good thing to bring him back again. So today, I'm going to ask you to just open your heart to hear what God has to say to you. Believe God with me for miracles in your life. Now join together with me, and let's give my friend Rick Fowler a warm Regency Church welcome as he comes to bring to you the word of the Lord today. God bless you. What a great honor it is just to worship the Lord, to be here with you and be a part of what God's doing. Some way, nobody told me that uh, Pastor John would be doing an introduction, but I knew some way, somehow, he would be here. In fact, uh, hi, Pastor John, I'm sure you're watching. What a, what a great day we've had already, amen? amen? The love of God, the presence of God, the power of God. We're just so thankful that we can just come together as believers of like faith, lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ, giving him praise, honor, and glory, and knowing that our God will receive our praise. And as he receives our praise, 
he just pours out blessing after blessing after blessing upon us. I'm so thankful for all that God has done in my life. I'm so thankful for the blessings of God. Aren't you glad you're saved today? I was this week, uh, a couple weeks ago, I heard on the news, uh, of course, we're all real sensitive and aware of the Ebola outbreak that's taking place, even more bad news today that possibly a, a uh, hospital worker that's been infected that cared there in, in Dallas for uh, one of the patients. So uh, a lot still to unfold. We don't know all the ramifications. But just a few weeks ago, one of the doctors who had been over in Africa came back. God graciously and wonderfully healed him up, raised him up through the care of, of doctors and the answers of prayers that the Lord raised him up. I give all healing, glory, and honor to the Lord, don't you? I, I don't care if doctors have been involved. Thank God for doctors. Amen? amen? You better say amen or don't go to them one or the other, you know? So we're thankful for what God uses them to do, but we realize that God made these bodies of ours, and if they get better, it's because he's involved in the process. So this past, a few weeks ago, when one of the doctors who had been uh, marvelously cured and is, is on his way, returning back to normal life, was asked to give blood, he stopped his course of life. He was on the way somewhere else. He stopped, went to the nearest hospital and gave blood because the antibodies in his blood were now valuable to help someone else, a cameraman or a videographer that was battling Ebola. And so he stopped so that his blood could make a difference. Come on, somebody with me? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ and the blood of the only begotten of the Father has made a difference in our lives? The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there remains no remission of our sins. I'm so glad that one day Jesus willingly stopped all that he was doing to lay down his life, that his blood could be shed, that you and I could be healed of the sin, sickness in our life and be made brand new. Thank God for the blood of Jesus today. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that has nothing to do with what I'm going to preach about this morning. But it's always great to give praise to the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, and I know you do, either on, uh, in your hand or on your phone or your iPad. And if you don't have one, just take your neighbors out of their hands and use theirs. Matthew chapter 14 is where we're going to go today. Matthew chapter 14, we're going to start reading at verse 24. This morning, I just want to uh, stir somebody up. And uh, I know the Lord's already been stirring you up, but this morning I came not with a message of soothing or healing. God's already been doing that. But I came just to, to really stir someone up, if necessary, just to rile somebody up. I just came this morning to get somebody to do what God's been asking you to do for some time. And I'm just here just to encourage you. I'm here just to add another word. This is from the Lord for you. Some of you hear from God on a regular basis. I know you do. And so today I'm just adding another log on the fire of what the Holy Spirit's already been saying to your life. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24. If you're there, say amen. amen. Why don't we do this? I know, why don't you stand with me, if you would, for the reading of the word? I'll let you sit when uh, we get through reading with no problem. I started to say I'll let you sit a long time, but some of you would walk out now that you're up, so we'll, I won't say it'll be a long time, but uh, I'll let you sit until we get through. How's that? The boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! They cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, of you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We're going to focus in on a couple of verses. Verse 28 and 29, Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. In verse 29, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I'm just going to encourage you this morning to get out of the boat. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell him, get out of the boat? Come on, would you just, just one more time, let's just declare it together. Get out of the boat. You may be seated. We live in a great area of the country that boating is something that we all are familiar with. Boating is something that we're involved in at times. And if you haven't been, I'm sure sometime in your life, if you're not right now, you've been in a boat and you've been sailing across the water. And the boat is a place of safety. It's a place of refuge. It's a place where you fish from. If you're like me, I fish very infrequently. And when I do fish, they seem to know I'm there. The fish seem to have other plans. The day I fish, I'm not a great fisherman, but uh, I always believe that if I'm fishing, it means I must try to catch something. So I've caught wire. I've caught plastic. I've caught seaweed by the ton. And occasionally I catch a fish or two. Not very often, but occasionally I do. On this occasion, Jesus and the disciples have been involved in the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Jesus goes off to pray, and he tells the disciples to sail to the other side. And while they're sailing across on the other side, across the Sea of Galilee, Juanisa and I have had the privilege of being there. It's kind of inset just a little bit with hills on either side of it. And it's not unusual for storms to come up very quickly because of the topography that's there. And all of a sudden, as they're sailing across, the winds get boisterous. And sure enough, when the people that love God are in a storm, he shows up. Did you get that? When the people that love God are in a storm, he shows up. Here comes Jesus walking out to where they are. They thought it was a ghost. They didn't know. They'd never seen anybody walk on the water like this. Who is this? And when they found out and Peter asked them if it was, Lord, who is it? And he said, don't be afraid. It's me. You guys just calm down. I'm coming to where you're at. Well, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come. He said, well, come on. Fowler's translation. And the Bible says then, it doesn't say it this way, but it gives us the understanding that Peter then jumped out of the boat and began to walk on the water. There are what I call get out of the boat moments in our life. Moments in our life when it's up to us, whether we'll stay in the comfort zone that where we're at, whether we'll just continue to maintain and ride out the storms of our life and be with everyone else huddled together or we'll take advantage of the opportunity to do something that we've never done before and get out of the boat. There are moments in our life when the Lord just says, come on, would you like to come? It was to me, every time I read this scripture, it's an invitation by the Lord to say, Peter, if you want to walk on the water, now's your opportunity. Now's your chance to see the miraculous take place. Now's your opportunity to participate in something that you've never participated in before. If you want to come, come on. But to do so, you've got to get out of the boat. You can't say in the boat, and do the miraculous. You can't stay in the boat and walk with him on the water. You can't stay in the boat and see God do great and mighty things. In order for things like that to take place, you've got to be willing to get out of the boat. This Bible that I read from cover to cover, it tells me and shows me illustration after illustration of people who had get out of the boat moments in their life. When God came to them, and it was up to them how they responded, whether or not they would stay where they were, or whether they would move forward, whether they would take the opportunity of a lifetime to do something great and wonderful for God. Now, I know everybody doesn't want to do that. I know there are a lot of people that are perfectly content to stay in the boat 
in the inner part of the boat, covered up by a blanket in the boat. I understand that there are people who don't even like the idea of even thinking about walking on the water. But there are some folks that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to and God has just stirred up my heart to share with you today that God is indeed calling us each one to step out of the boat, to take advantage of the get out of the boat moments in our lives. The first person that I read in the Bible that had one of those get out of the boat moments is a man by the name of Abram. We know him as Abraham, the father of the faithful, the seed of sand of the, sand of the sea and the stars in the sky, the promises that God made him. But before all of those things took place, in Genesis chapter 12, the Bible tells us in chapter 11, we're introduced to Abram. And God calls him from the Ur of Chaldees, from a place where people who are involved in worshiping the moon, the sun, the stars, the God who made the moon, the sun, and the stars, gets a hold of Abram. And he says to him, now get out of your country and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all the families of the earth shall be in you. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse number four of Genesis chapter 12 says this. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And a lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Let me just tell you, Abram, Abraham as we know him, he had a get out of the boat moment. God began to speak to him. If you want more than this, Abram, if you want to be blessed beyond your wildest dreams, I've got an opportunity for you. But in order to seize that opportunity, in order for it to be part of your life, you've got to leave the comfort zone. You've got to get out from where you're at. You've got to be willing to kiss mom and dad goodbye. You've got to be willing to say goodbye to all the things you've known. You've got to be willing to say goodbye to all the traditions of the past because I'm going to take you to a place that you've never been. But in order to get there, you've got to step out of the boat. You've got to get out from where you're at. Now, some people would say, well, if God told me that he would bless me and he would bless me beyond all my wildest dreams. If God told me he would make me the father of many nations, if God told me he would bless those who bless me and curse those that curse me, of course I would leave where I'm at. Of course I would get out of the boat. Oh, really? How do you know what God wants to do in your life? How do you know what tomorrow holds for you? How do you know what God has in store? I know this that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. I know that the blessings of God are beyond our comprehension. I know what God wants to do for each one of us is more than we could even think about. If we knew what God wanted to do, some of us would just lay down in the floor and cry because we couldn't imagine God taking us these places and doing these things through us. I'm just telling you today, I'm just wanting to encourage you today that when you have one of those get out of the boat moments, seize the opportunity. Seize the moment. Jump out of the boat. Get out of the boat and move where God wants you to move and do what God wants you to do. If you're, a, if you're remotely with me today, say amen. amen. Thank you so much. That was good. Praise God. That was better than my preaching, so thank you very much. David had a get out of the boat moment. One of the things I like that the Bible tells us about David, it tells us so many things about him. And he's one of the one of the high points of the Bible. But he had a moment in his life where he had to choose to get out of the boat or just continue to be who he was. We first are introduced to David when Samuel comes to anoint the next king. In 1 Samuel 16, we're introduced to David then because he's out doing what he's supposed to do. He's out just tending the sheep. And Samuel's looking for the next king and can't find him anywhere. And he says to Jesse, don't you have any other kids? I'm missing it somewhere. He said, well, I got one more. He's working. Can you reach over and look at your neighbor and say, thank God for working, folks. <laughs> the older I get, the more thankful I am for him every day. I want some younger folks to work so I won't have to one day. 
Anybody that agrees with that, say amen. Come on. Hallelujah. I'm getting, I'm, I'm feeling it now. <laughs> I've got this young guy out there. He's still tending the, bring him in. When he brings him in, you know the story. Samuel sees him and the Holy Spirit confirms this is the one and he anoints him the next king over Israel. Next chapter, we flip the page into chapter 17. All of a sudden, Israel is in battle again with the Philistines who plagued them continually. And there's this nine-foot-tall guy every day comes out and stands on the hill and says, Hey! Rick's reading version. Hey! Send your champion out. We'll fight. Whoever wins, that's who'll be, that'll be who's victorious. Nine feet tall, Goliath. Intimidating everybody. Speaking, hurling insults at him. Not just one day, not just two days. The Bible says he did it for 40 days. That's just like the devil, isn't it? Basically, the devil is somebody who tries to intimidate us. Tries to tell us, this is what I'll do to you. This is how I'll take you down. This is what you're going to experience. This is what's going to happen in your life. Let me just tell you, if you don't remember, remember this today. The devil is a liar. He's the father of lies. And when he speaks a lie, it's right from the throne of lies. Let me just tell you today that the devil wants to intimidate you and I so that we'll back off from what God wants us to do and what God wants us to be. We just need to rise up and say, devil, you can lie to me all you want to. I know in whom I have believed. I know what God told me is still true. I know the word of God is still anointed and powerful. I know the Holy Spirit speaks to me every day. I know I met the Lord in prayer today and he hasn't changed his mind about me or the plans that he has for me. Come on. Here David comes, sent by his father to take some cheese and bread and wine to his brothers who are there fighting. And when he gets there, he hears the insults. He's worried, he's upset, he's riled up by him. What is going on? Somebody needs to go out there and fight him. I'll fight him. And just like a good brother in the church, I mean just like a good brother out in the field, says, what are you trying to do, show off? Just trying to make a name for yourself. Of course you'll sing the solo. Of course you'll fill in. Of course you'll lead the congregation. Of course you'll be the first one that's seen. Of course you will. You're just wanting everybody to see you. And David says, it has nothing to do with that. I'm just not going to sit here and listen to and talk about us and our God like that. So after he debates with Saul what he can do, and he tells Saul, listen, he tells him, I, I, don't, I can't wear your armor. All I know is that God prepared me for this moment. God got me ready. I've been tending the flocks. I've been practicing with my slingshot. You have never seen me sling a stone, but when you do, you'll know I'm ready for this. And oh, by the way, I killed a lion and I killed a bear, and this guy will be nothing in the hands of our God. So the Bible says that he finally relented and Saul said, if you want to fight him, fight him. It's a get out of the boat moment. It's a moment that he could have just stayed doing what he was supposed to do. He could have just stayed with the pack. He could have just huddled down with his brothers. He could have waited out Goliath. But it was a moment that God gave him, an opportunity. And David said, isn't there a cause? We're going to fight. We're going to rise up. And literally, the Bible says that when David faced Goliath, and he told him, you come to me with a sword and a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of the armies of hosts, whom you defiled, whom you defied this day, that God is going to go with me because the battle is not mine, but the battle is the Lord's. The Bible says that he put a stone in his sling and he ran, he ran to Goliath. Somebody was checking his mental faculties. He didn't just stand there and say, bring it on, big boy. He ran toward, he slung the stone and ran toward him. The Bible says it like this, that David, verse seven, chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, verse 48, that when he drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army 
to meet the Philistine. What was he doing? He was jumping out of the boat. I'm, I can't stay here. I've got to do something. This is my opportunity. This is the time, the moment that God's given me. He jumped out of the boat, ran towards him, slung his stone, hit him in the forehead. He dropped to the ground. It's dead, and David didn't have a sword, but the enemy had one. Whew, what the enemy was trying to use against him, God used against the enemy. He ran to him and picked up the sword, chopped off his head, held it up for everybody to see. I know that, you know, we talk about Hollywood movies. This is not, this is real life. This is reality. I want everybody to see the champion is gone, that our God has delivered. And the Philistine armies got confused, scattering everywhere. And David, oh, David got the king's daughter. But ladies, even better than that, his daddy got his taxes paid. All the men say amen. amen. I'm just telling you. I, that's, what the, that's what the reward was. You're going to get the king's daughter, whoever kills Goliath, and his taxes will be forgiven. I could stand in use of that real, real, real good. He jumped out of the boat. He didn't stay there any longer. There was an opportunity. There was a moment. He could have just relented. He could have stayed there but he jumped out of the boat. We look at other people throughout the Bible, and we could just list them one right after another. Moses had to get out of the boat moment when he took off his shoes when he was standing on holy ground and he stood before Pharaoh. He could have just said, I'm not going to do this. There's no way. I, I'm not the man for it. He tried to relent, and God wouldn't let him, but yet he went, and he stood before Pharaoh. Elijah on Mount Carmel, when he faced off the false prophets, it was a get-out-of-the-boat moment. It was a moment in time, an opportunity for him to step out and say, I'm going to be obedient to God. Elisha and the miracles that came from him were step out of the boat moments. Daniel, when Daniel was told, don't pray any longer, and he prayed anyway, and they threw him in the lion's den. His kneeling on the ground, his praying three times a day was simply an act of, I'm getting out of the boat. I'm just today Moved in my spirit just to know that God is speaking to people today. Get out of the boat. Jump out. Now, when these opportunities come, there are some things that are necessary for us to understand about getting out of the boat. The first thing that we have to understand at this get out of the boat moment, number one, we've got to make sure it's the Lord. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you better hear from God. Isn't it amazing sometimes how many other people hear from God on your behalf? I believe the Lord's wanting you to do that. Oh, really? Why don't you do it? You hear so good. You know, I was just talking to God the other day, and I think, Rick, I think he was asking you to go give all your money away. Oh, really? I believe God was just stirring that up, that you need to make a sizable donation. Okay, I'll match yours. <laughs> well, now, I don't know that God was saying it for me. Well, listen, I talked to God today. He didn't mention it. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. Now, listen, I'm all for, I'm excited. My spirit stirred up within me for people to jump out of the boat. But if we're going to jump out of the boat, we better make sure it's God. We better make sure it's the Lord. We better make sure that we know. And the Bible says this about jumping out of the boat. He said to Peter, Lord, if it's you, command me to you on the water, to come to you on the water. Peter said, I'll do it, Lord, if it's you. You notice who he didn't ask? Everybody in the boat. What do you guys think? You think that's the Lord out there? I don't know who it is. I don't know, just about seasick myself. I'm not sure if it's the Lord or not out there. What are you asking me for? Well, it's just, it looks like him out there. We, we look to everybody else to confirm what God wants to speak to us about. And I believe in confirmation. I believe in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I believe that God speaks to a variety of people, sources, places. I believe that God, who wants us to do his will, can get our attention. If you believe that's true, say amen. amen. Sometimes we ignore it, but God will still keep speaking to us, still keep talking to us. On this occasion, we just have to know we can't jump out on a whim. 
We can't jump out because it feels good. And I'm, I'm kind of, if you haven't already noticed, I'm, I'm kind of excitable and emotional. I was screaming at my television last night. They weren't listening to me, but I was yelling anyway. What are you doing? Nobody answered that question. Not even anybody in my house even answered. They all ignored me. It's like, leave him alone. He's in his own world. But our emotions can play with us. We've got to know it's the Lord. We've got to know it's God. So we ask him. You know what we call that? Prayer. Just ask him. Praying. Calling on his name. Lord, is this you wanting me to leave my comfort zone to step out and do something I've never done? Is this you wanting me to make a move, Lord, that I just really didn't see coming? Is this you, Lord, that's got my attention? Or is this something, is this a phase in life? Is this something I'm going through? Is this something that just feels, did somebody talk me into this? Lord, is this you? Are you stirring my heart? Are you speaking to me? We just simply must pray. I had a friend of mine who's since gone on to his reward and glory. His name was Ed, and every time I'd ask Ed, I'd call him up, and he'd be my prayer buddy and fasting buddy, and he and I would pray together and fast together about things. And when I'd call him up, I'd say, hey, Ed, I want to so-and-so. I'd run by you. And he said, well, Rick, you know what we need to do? I said, what's that? He said, pray, pray, pray. That's a good idea. So I'd call him up later and, hey, Ed, something, this is going on, and just wanted to see what you thought. He said, well, I'll just tell you what we need to do. Pray, pray, pray. After about the fourth or fifth time I heard pray, 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 I asked him, I said, is there anything else we can do? <laughs> Anybody besides me ever felt like that? Do you have another answer? And you know what his response to me was? No. Don't have another answer. Because if we're going to hear from God, we better pray Pray, pray. We better know it's the Lord. We better know it's God. God, are you speaking this to me? Is this you? Lord, is it you? If it's you, tell me to come on. If it's you, come. The Bible says in verse 19 that the Lord said to him, come. And the scripture says that when Peter had come down out of the boat. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Come on. Instantaneous obedience. He jumped out of the boat, climbed out of the boat, got down out of the boat, however he had to do it. We pray and ask God about things. God tells us what to do. And then we say, well, I better check with somebody else real quick first. It's a good thing. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And then the Lord said, come, that he didn't say, just a moment. Hey, John, what do you think? Right. Levi, what do you think? Matthew, you think I ought to go? You think I ought to just do this? Well, well what did you do? I asked the Lord if it was him, tell me to come. Well, what did he say? He said, come. So do you think I ought to go? I'm just wondering, listen, hey, Marsha, can I have an appointment with the pastor? I want to ask him something. What do you want to ask? Well, I've been praying about something. I asked the Lord about it. The Lord told me to do it, but I want to see what he thought. Now, somebody, real quick, don't, don't look at me and think, are you anti-pastor? No, not in your life. I'm just simply saying, if you've asked God, if you've talked to God, you've been praying, who are you now looking for validation from? And I'm not talking about changing church structure or anything like that. Don't, don't go in that direction. I'm just talking about you've been asking the Lord, Lord, is this really you? Is this what you want me to do? And if you've heard from the Lord, then you need to say, Lord, yes. 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 Now, if it means the Lord told you to drive my car, you might want to ask me. Are you with me? 
If the Lord told you to do something that involves somebody else, you might want to talk to them as well. If the Lord told you, go over and just tear down all of the roof off your neighbor's house, why don't you give your neighbor a call ahead of time before they shoot you or something? Call the police. I got this crazy brother from church over here tearing up my roof, trying to tell me God spoke to him about it, but he never told me anything about it. I'm trying to talk to you today about what God is speaking to you individually about your life things that God is prompting you to do, things that God is stirring you up to do, things that God is getting hold of your life to do, to just get out of the boat, get out of the comfort zone, put down the remote, set down the glass of iced tea, stay out of the mall, just do, just, Lord, what have I heard from you? Get out of the boat. Now, some people think that getting out of the boat doesn't take anything. It's just, you just kind of just jump out. Let me just tell you, getting out of the boat takes courage. It takes courage to do what you've never done. Peter never walked on water. I know that we just think, well, this guy was just so instantaneous, spontaneous, that he just, just on a whim, just jumped out. To courage on his part. It takes courage to start a new business. It takes courage to leave everything you've known to go in a different direction. It takes courage to hug your mom and dad goodbye and say, I've got to go do what God wants me to do. It takes courage to move in a way that the family doesn't necessarily agree with. It takes courage to make a stand for the Lord. It takes courage. The Bible says that God spoke to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. Verse number six and verse number seven told him to lead the children of Israel. And this is what he said, but be strong and be courageous. Said in verse number seven, only be strong and very courageous. Verse number nine, he said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid nor dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm here to tell you today, Getting out of the boat takes courage, spiritual courage. It's not for the faint of heart. The faint of heart will stay in the boat. The faint of heart will be encouraging one another. The faint of heart will just be talking about you as you step out. The faint of heart will be wondering, what is this idiot doing now? The faint of heart will think they're so spiritual. They're always, listen, the faint of heart don't have the courage to jump out of the boat, to get out of the boat. It takes courage. I'm not talking to somebody today that's not courageous. The third thing that I want you to realize when you get out of the boat that you might fail. And if you fail, humble yourself. Humble yourself. You've heard from the Lord, you jump out of the boat and you're courageous about what you're doing and all of a sudden, distractions come. When you're asking God, you've got tunnel vision. Lord, is it you? If it's you, tell me to come. It's me, here I come. When Peter jumped out of the boat, the winds were blowing, the waves were rocking, but it didn't mean anything to him then. It was only when he started doing something he couldn't do that he began to realize, uh-oh, these waves are bad. This situation's not good. I can't do this. And the next thing you know, the Bible says that he began to sink. And he cried out. What did he cry out? Lord, save me. Proud people don't ask to be saved. Proud people are more concerned about what others think of them. Pride will keep us from being saved. Pride will keep us from admitting we have failed. But if you look through all the examples that I mentioned to you this morning, they all fail. They all fail. The Bible says Abram, who was left Ur of Chaldees to follow God, 
you continue to read it in the book of Genesis, he leaves in chapter 12. By chapter 15, he's already having to hear from the Lord because he lied in chapter 13 and 14. God has to tell him in chapter 15, hey, the deal's still on. The promises are still real. But he failed along the way. I'm not here advocating, promoting failure. I'm just simply saying that just because somebody jumps out of the boat, they do something they've never done, they find themselves in need of being saved, doesn't mean that they miss the Lord at all. The Bible says even Moses was told on one occasion to strike the rock, and he did. On another occasion, out of frustration, he struck the rock when God told him to speak to the rock. Failed. Joshua, the man that God said, be strong and courageous. Be very courageous. The Lord is with you wherever you go. Only be strong and be of good courage, for I'm with you. The Bible says that he got so full of pride, he didn't even ask the Lord about fighting Ai. It cost people their life because he didn't inquire of the Lord had such great success at Jericho, he figured he could do it on his own. Didn't even ask God about things. Just began to do some stuff on his own and didn't even realize that there had some sin had entered to camp. We read through these people throughout the Bible. Elijah, Elijah was hiding. He was afraid to go out. He'd just seen the slaughter of the false prophets called down fire from heaven. And now he's hiding for his life saying, I'm the only one serving you, God. Sounds like some of our prayers, doesn't it? I wish everybody else worshiped like I do. I'm the only one in the whole church that really gets involved. I know you probably don't say that. But somebody does. We won't look at them though, okay? We won't. Lord, save me. Sometimes it's the fear of failure that keeps us in the boat. David killed Goliath through the power of the Lord. The battle is not ours, but it's the Lord's. Amen. Amen. But if we keep reading, he was on a rooftop one day when he should have been somewhere else. And he sinned with Bathsheba. I'm just here to tell you today that even Peter himself who walked on water and needed the Lord to bring him out and the Lord says that he chastised him because of his lack of faith at the moment. Even Peter who said, Lord, if everybody else leaves you, I will never forsake you. Turned his back on the Lord. And yet we see him in the book of Acts in the upper room filled with the Holy Spirit preaching and 3,000 people are getting saved. And Acts chapter 3, reaching down and lifting up a man who's crippled from birth and seeing a healing take place and preaching and 5,000 people are getting saved. And we see him later on walking through the outer courts where people are laying sick folk and his shadow is healing them. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell him, maybe we need to get out of the boat? Stand with me if you would. The reality is that sometime in our life, all of us have failed. If you know that's true, say amen. amen. But we can't let the fear of failure paralyze us from obeying God and jumping out of the boat. I echo the words of Pastor John when he says that this is the, ar the autumn harvest of miracles. If you agree with that, say amen. And it's not going to come if we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over. It may be that God's saying, I want to do something miraculous for you. Would you jump out of the boat? 
I'll let you do something you've never done. What's your moment? What's God stirring you up about? What's your get out of the boat moment that God is calling you to? Where's the place that God is saying, are you willing to take a risk on my behalf? Or do you want to look back over your life? They surveyed people that were 80 years old one time and asked them three things in their life that if they could do over, what would it be? And one that occurred on every survey was, I wish I would have taken more risk. I wish I wouldn't have played life so safe because I realize some things just don't matter as much as I thought they did. I don't want to look back at my life and say, I wish I would have. Maybe if I did, things would have been different. What if I had jumped out the boat at that moment? What would God have done through me? When they got to the boat, the Bible says the wind ceased. I'm just going to add my own commentary. The wind ceased, and Peter was immediately surrounded by the disciples. How was it to walk on the water? Tell us. Tell us. How did it feel for those few steps as you were walking to Jesus? Tell us. How was it? How was it? When the water was below you and you were stepping on top of it. Well, guys, I failed. I, we know you failed. We know that. But you, you don't understand. I, I, I could have done more. I, I, we know that you could have done more. But you're the only one right, that jumped out. You're the only one that was enough courage, enough instantaneous obedience to not question anymore. Tell us. How was it when the Holy Spirit spoke through you? Tell us. How was it when God used you to raise up an army of believers? Tell us. How was it when God used you to start a business that you never thought was going to flourish and through it all you've given glory and honor to God? Tell us. How was it to leave the comfort? Tell me how it was. How was it for God to work through you perform miracles on his behalf. Maybe it's just time for us to get out of the boat. If you're here this morning, you'd say to me, hey, Rick, you know what? If the Lord speaks to me, if God shows me, and if God directs me, this is really, I'm laying it really, really loosely here, okay? I think I'd be ready to get out of the boat, or at least I want to be ready to get out of the boat. Would you just raise your hand? I want to be ready to get out of the boat. Maybe I, you know, you never know until the opportunity comes. Can I just be totally honest with you? Our son lives in Texas. He went to school out in Dallas and fell in love with the city and he loves it more than he loves us, so he's there. You parents know what I'm talking about. He's in Dallas. We're here, okay? So this never happened in our family before. He started dating a young black lady. Somebody came to me and said, hey, Rick, what do you think? I said, what do I think about what? I said, well, we know that your son is, is dating a, a black lady. I said, yeah. They said, well, are you prejudiced? I said, I don't think so. I said, but you know what? Are you ready? I said, we're going to find out. Are you with me? I said, we're going to find it. I don't think I am. I've, I've preached and taught and love everybody. I think I do. I said, but we're getting ready to find out if we are. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell him, I think he passed the test. We got a little two-year-old grandson. I think he passed the test. 
okay? Yeah, pass the test. But you don't, somebody, well, sure, I'd jump out of the boat. Really? Really? Ready? Set? Well, wait a minute. Right. What do you mean, wait a minute? Well, I, I sure I'm going to, sure, if it's the Lord. Okay, it's the Lord. Are you ready? Set? Well, wait a minute. A few years ago, Juanis and I went boating and skiing on one of the lakes uh, and um, nearby where we were living with a, with a couple, their family. We were having a great day, and they took us over to a tree that overhangs the lake. And they said, hey, Rick, that's the tree everybody jumps from. I said, that ain't nothing. You know, I'm 40-something at the time, 40-something-year-old man. I can jump out of that tree. I was sitting in that comfortable boat. They said, really? I said, yeah, I can jump out. They said, well, Mike jam jumped out of it. I said, well, that ain't nothing. They said, well, there's the tree. All right. Man, I'm, I'm raised in Florida. I've been swimming since I was a little kid. I dove in the water, backstroked over to it, climbed out the tree, up the tree, got to the limb, and I realized the tree was a whole lot closer to the water when I was in the boat. I mean, I looked over and I thought, I, is this the same tree? Uh-huh. Is this the limb? Yep. Really? Uh-huh. You mean everybody jumps right there? So I was there talking to God about it. <laughs> Lord, do you really want me to jump or have I gotten myself way over my head? And while me and the Lord are dialoguing about this jump that I'm getting ready to take, because now my manhood and pride is at stake, I'm standing there out there on the limb and I look beside me and a little eight-year-old boy does this. Boom, and jumps. And as he jumped, I thought, that boy has never jumped like that probably. He's never hurt his knee. He's never hurt his back. He's not 40-something years. I had every excuse in the world. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I just heard myself say, I had no way down but jumping now. So I screamed and jumped at the same time. We've got every excuse in the world why we can't do what God wants us to do. They don't know what it would be. What if I fail? What if I don't make it? Humble yourself and just cry out, Lord, save me. Save me. If you want to be ready to jump out the boat at God's call, would you just lift up your hands toward him? Father, today, as an act of surrender, we just declare to you, Lord, bid us to come at the opportunity, at the moment that you call us. Get us ready to go. Make us ready to jump. Let our eyes be upon you. Let our faith rest in you. May we trust in you. May we lean upon you. Lord, may we have a relationship with you that when you say jump, we just say yes, Lord. We'll jump. We'll come. Whatever it might be. Lord, today, may we be willing to leave the comfort zone, the safety of the boat, to do what we've never done for your glory and for your honor and your power. Would you reach over and lay your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you? Would you pray that God would give them courage beyond their ability? Courage beyond what they ever thought. Yes, Lord. That God would raise them up. Father, today, stir us up. Stir us up by your Spirit. Stir us up today, Lord. Give us the courage to run after you. 
Give us the courage to jump forth and walk into places that, Lord, we never thought we would go in, but because of you, Lord, give us instantaneous obedience to your call, to your voice, to your will. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray today. We believe you right now in your name. Hallelujah.